how do you think that the televised debate and the radio debate impacted the vote or not impact the vote in this case? I think understanding the role of, of any debate in, in an election cycle starts with understanding what a debate is and, and what it means in the history of kind of, you know, our, the evolution of the election environment in general, which I'm thinking about here more in terms of a kind of communication space than a decision making space, you know, going to the ballot yeah. and, you know, and, and going to the polls and voting. So let's start with, with, you know, with this thing we call a debate. First of all, the, the word debate is really kind of a misnomer. I mean, we have, in our, our, we have this idea, going you know, back to high school, really, of, you know, a couple of people, you know, earnestly debating whether the UN is a good or bad thing or, you know, you, know, you, you name it. And a debate is really, a, a, as a kind of word, a placeholder for what is a far more complex event within the, the communication environment uh, of an election. What is a debate? It is, it is a job interview for uh, the leaders or the candidates uh, we, are, we are dealing with. It is an instance of political theater where we see personalities clash and, and kind of the marketplace of ideas kind of formed before our eyes. It is a stress test for people under pressure, speaking to thousands or even you know, millions of people, um, U.S. situation, um, under pressure, trying to articulate who they are and what they do. It, it is an allegory. I mean, that the, the leaders, the BC debate, for example, all representing very different political philosophies and, and different different parties, and you know the kind of you know the a whole you know electorate divided among these three parties, um, and these ideas and these histories all given 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 voice, and it is a rare moment too of 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 unstructured indeterminate um kind of radical uncertainty i mean you know elections are highly scripted right everybody is is playing it safe because you may have you know uh, some some candidate with the, the wrong social media post or or some accident on the trail or, or some instance of embarrassment so campaigns are very conservative in that sense and of course as we know especially in the united states a lot of campaigning is done through television and through social media, controlled, you know, kind of manicured, you know, kind of largely made safe. And so what we call a debate is really about six different things at once, which makes it really, uh, whether the debate is good or bad, makes debates in general necessary and fascinating parts of, of that, you know, that part of democracy that is, is you know, how we communicate, you know, and, and proceed to an election choice. So I start there by saying, let's unpack this thing we call the debate and appreciate that it's about it's a half a dozen things all happening at once in a highly compressed hothouse environment. You know, an hour, 90 minutes, the stakes being high, there being typically very few debates now in any election cycle, one in BC, for example, and and that's it. And also I should ask too, should add too. It is a moment of coalescence. I mean, you know, people's lives are busy. Elections are very noisy and busy um, uh, intervals. And it is a point of coalescence for the public who, who is often not necessarily paying close attention, the so-called low information voter. But a lot of people, you know, partisans and nonpartisans alike will show up and, and watch because it is, a, it is a campaign ad. It is a platform uh, exposition. It is a, it is a, uh, a, a brief lecture in what the parties want and believe. And if you're not someone who has the time to read through platforms or websites or pour through the political journalism of the day, it's all that in one. It's a quick study in, you know, what's at stake and what the parties are bringing to us and why, why we should care. So it's that it's a remarkably compressed and important phenomenon. And, and more so, and I'll get to this point in a moment, because of the evolution of that communication environment, that political information environment over time. Well, sure. Now, how do you think that the debate fits into a 21st century campaign compared to a 20th? Is it more important or less important? Oh, that's a great question, Lee. So we can track the history of, of kind of uh, political communication in an election environment in terms of a, a kind of a two-step um, or two-phase history. If you go back, think of think of the Lincoln and Douglas debates. You know, in in the you know in, at the beginning of the American Civil War, um, you know, 
you know, it used to be that we th thought about um, communication within an election environment in terms of what we would call a public communication model, public communication model. That's elections that are a tapestry of rallies and and speeches and um, you know people uh, you know consulting pamphlets and and you know kind of reading closely into what a given party is is offering. It's it's where publics participated more fully, where the politics was more personal, where we had you know conversations at the doorstep with candidates, um, and were you know fully part of the process. What happened in the latter part of the 20th century is we moved from this venerable model, which goes back to really to the foundations of democracy, um, to what's called a political marketing model. And this is where, uh, uh, you know, a consumer marketing logic overtook how we articulate politics, how we talk about it, and turned politics, in, in, in a sense, into a kind of sales job. And so now it's, you know, it's identifying demographics and bringing them targeted messages. It's relying more and more on, on, on the air war rather than the ground war. It's using television and increasingly social media to push messages in, in the right direction and to animate the demographics that, that you wish to. But what that means is that some of the conversational kind of communicational dimensions that, that made the political communication phase so enchanting, so, so vividly and personally democratic have disappeared. I mean, we're kind of being sold on what are the Greens or what's the Saskatchewan party or what are the New Democrats offering us? Are we buying it or are we not? And we make a kind of sales decision. And that conflation of the political and the economic of democracy and capitalism is, is a tension that we don't ever want to collapse personally. I mean, if, if voting is just another consumer preference, it loses you know, its meaning. It loses its, its, its democratic legitimacy. Um, but more and more, political marketing has turned politics and political communication into something that kind of can feel like a consumer choice. Um, so with that history in, in mind, political communication to political marketing, um, why are debates so important? Because they are a powerful connection back to that older tradition. I mean, yes, it's on TV. Yes, it might be thousands or even millions watching. But it's like the Lincoln and Douglas debates. There are several people on the stage, unscripted, relatively free of talking points, under pressure, trying to give voice in the way that matters in a democracy to, to the ideas that matter and, and, and making the case for why you should uh, vote for them. And I think that the romance of politics and that echo of that earlier tradition shows up more powerfully in the debate than in any of the other more nostalgic parts of our current political information environment. So when the candidate's at the doorstep, that's wonderful too, right? You can ask him or her, you know, what do you believe? Who are you? Why should I care? But they are representatives of the larger party. The leader is the party. You know, they are allegorically the green, the NDP, the liberal, and they're to speak the highest level to, you know, what these parties are about. So for me, that's why debates are so important. It's that, that the political romance, that, that connection back to that, that venerable tradition of political communication that we never want to disappear. We never want to turn elections into, into you know, some kind of consumer um, construct. Understood. And in the case of the recent BC debates, do you think that there was any sort of change that would come about for a, a marginal voter and in which way it might lean? Would they be more inclined to vote NDP, more inclined to vote for the Green Party, or are we talking about really a very negligible effect in the end? You and I, as, as people who study politics carefully, love debates and have high expectations of them because they personalize in the politics and take us back to the public communication model. Um, but generally speaking, if you take all the debates that you and I have witnessed, you know, um, and followed with great care, very few have actually moved the needle politically. There are rare moments. I think of 1984. You know, John Turner and Brian Mulroney, famously, you know this one, right? Where Turner yeah. is, demand, is asked by Mulroney, you know, you had an option, sir, not to give all these patronage appointments to liberals at the end of the, the Trudeau-Turner, uh, you know, sort of government. And that turned the tide in, in that election. We've seen most recently in the U.S. with the first and only debate we're probably going to get from Trump and Biden, that 
let's call it a debate, it was more of a demolition derby or a Munster truck rally, but like, that moved three to five points of public opinion in a country we know is profoundly polarized. Like that's massive. No ad would ever. Which direction, which direction did it move it? To Biden. To Biden, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and that's, that's fairly empirical. That's been tracked pretty carefully. So it's not, not wishful thinking on <laughs> my part. So, so all things being equal, debates don't typically uh, move the needle, but they, they have other, um, some do, uh, the rare one does, but they, they have certain knock-on effects. So right now we're seeing in BC um, a surge of, of, um, of funding, of, of, of money going to the Greens because, and we can speak with the BC debate in a sec, but Sonia first to know probably won that debate and she did quite well as the fresh new face on the stage. And uh, you know her wellness or her success in part was defined by her putting the question to, to, to Premier Horgan, the question of the election, which is why are we having an election? You know, um, as you know, it's, it, we're a year out from the fixed election law, and you know, and the confidence supply agreement between the Greens and the NDP was broken prematurely. Uh, and so the question that's been hanging over this election is is existential: why an election in a pandemic? Full stop. So she, so I don't know if you saw the debate, but Andrew Wilkinson kind of brilliantly sets it up and he says, you, the voter, should you trust John Horgan because he's called an election when we didn't need it? And then Sonia Firstino finishes that thought with great moral passion and says, you broke this agreement with us. The three parties are doing so well in fighting the pandemic. This kind of, all, you know, kind of, um, uh, you know, um, remarkable cooperation between these three parties in government to fight the pandemic and you've squandered all that goodwill that we build up among the public for your own, this is first no talking, your own, you know, kind of uh, self-interested uh, purposes. And that, that, was the, that was the great moment in the debate. It was about three quarters in, and it was a you know, fairly ordinary debate, and then boom. And Horgan, you know, go, goes back to the, the, the talking point, which is we need a surplus of politics now in order to get past politics and build a recovery. <laughs> After, right? Interesting. Yeah. Well, that is an interesting tack. And I'm a bit curious because I know in the classic 1960 debate where they said people who heard the debate like Nixon, the people who saw the debate like Kennedy, for some reason, Wilkinson is not perceived as well liked or personable as the other leaders. So, if, I mean, I, there was an Angus Reid poll and it showed how biased people are towards their own political opinions because post debate, they said, you know, the Liberal voters thought that Wilkinson won, dramatically so. The NDP voters thought that Horgan won, dramatically so. And then the Green ones especially. And then the Greens were the second choice of both the others, mm -hmm. uh, of the main parties. And, but it was a lot more strong and strident for the NDP ones than it was uh, in the case of the Liberals, because there were 5% of the Liberal voters that thought that Horgan won, but there was 0% of the NDP voters that thought that Wilkinson won. So there's a lot of confirmation bias. And oh, yes. Uh, but I'm wondering if uh, just in, in visual versus audio, do you think that Wilkinson would have a better chance in the marketplace of ideas if, if they're only listening to him? I'm just I'm wondering why he doesn't seem as personable to the average BC voter. Well, I think I mean, you know, this is where we can be media critics in a sense, right? So t a television is a, is a, obviously a visual medium. Um, and it, as you know, from going back to the, the Kennedy Nixon debate, that was something that McLuhan among others was fascinated in. Why, why did Nixon look so bad on television and Kennedy so good? Nixon was a considerable mind, very smart individual, probably on paper more capable intellectually than Kennedy. And yet they show up and Kennedy's this wonderful, handsome, telegenic guy and Nixon is you know, a, a, a hot personality in a cool medium, as McLuhan said, sweating and looking anxious and making us a little anxious too. So I think, you know, all that being said, in a visual medium, the ability to co convey presence and warmth and authenticity, even though those things aren't necessarily the most important things in politics, matter enormously. Personal, though, I think was better able to work within the visual grammar of television um, and be warm and personable and real and she she was initially uh, nervous who wouldn't be and then kind of warmed in the role um and and the other two stayed largely within their talking points she stepped out and again brought that great question 
why are we having this election? You know, um, and uh, you know, it's again, this is not a technical point. The Greens felt personally betrayed, and as you know, they were wrong-footed coming into this election. They had to scramble to get candidates. They they're still lacking ten or twelve candidates. They don't have no, enough nominated candidates to populate all eighty-seven ridings. The R Liberals were kind of ready. The NDP certainly was ready. The Greens were not, and. And they lack the organizational capacity as the third party here with two caucus members, right? They just don't have the resources to, you know, get 87 people nominated in these 87 writings in a week. Right? Like how do yeah, you well, especially when uh, first Noah just gotten the leadership very shortly before then. Yeah, a month ago. And yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's a very steep learning curve. And I'm wondering too, if this uh, election is, or the debate in the election is more important because you can't have the kind of personal gatherings in COVID. Does that give an added importance to the debate? Oh, absolutely. So, I mean, candidates are not coming to our doorsteps. So it's the leader who comes to our virtual doorstep, i.e. our TV screen or, you know, the YouTube clip we watch. And, and that's, that's it. I mean, that, I mean, we, we want to need our, our politics to be personalized because, you know, pol politics can be the, cruel and abstract and, and tied up in systems and process. And, you know, the whole, even the, the etymology of democracy, demos, the people, it's about people and human contact. And we have a virtualized election now, which is so inconsistent with the kind of, kind of um, incarnate nature of politics, right? You go to the rally, you, you, you go to the speech, you're, you see the candidate at the door. It's part of the, the the loveliness of politics, the romance of it. So now it's entirely virtualized where the IT department matters more than the political strategists in some sense. And so the, 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 the debate is that virtual doorstep. It's like, there they are talking for a while. And I, I have great respect for all three um, uh, leaders, uh, but you're right in that Wilkinson is, although one of the smartest people to ever hold a position of leadership in BC politics, Rhodes Scholar, doctor, lawyer, it, charm is not his strength. And, and he struggled, I think, and this is a prevailing opinion. Sometimes it's hard to separate that from the real truth, but the commentariat argues that he's not been able to kind of bring that warmth, nor that kind of every man persona that, that um, Horgan is, is fairly good at. But I think all that said, it was, I think it was first to notice debate. She, she did quite well. Well, uh, we've covered a lot of bases here. Is there anything that you'd like to say in a closing comment to the value debates or the effect of this one? I would say, I think, you know, as, as, as politics becomes, and I, I fear ever more a marketing exercise and less a, less a public communication one, I think we, we need to hold on and value the, the role of the debate. And let's appreciate that actual number of people, say in BC or, or in, in Saskatchewan who, who watch the debate uh, kind of unfold, is probably rather small, but the debates live on in clips and comments and social media posts. Um, they are remarkably important. And for a lot of people whose politics are, you know, you know, uh, uh, political people's political literacy is uneven, right? I mean, it's just a fact of life. And so getting, getting human beings in positions of power like this, these leaders to speak about ideas is incredibly important just as a channel or a form of political information. I mean, not many Canadians are going to read the, the editorial endorsement in a newspaper or an op-ed piece um, or, or read a platform website for that matter. But they're going to probably get a bitter, you know, some piece uh, of a debate um, that, you know, shows up in their feed or, or in a comment a friend makes. And, and, and so we, as much as we might find them disappointing in terms of moving the election dynamics, because those are typically set long before the election, they do, they do bring us back to, I think, what is really best and, and, and defining of, of, of democratic politics, back to that public communication model. Well, Mr. Black, thank you so much for speaking with me today. I sure oh, appreciate it. Oh, it's a pleasure. It.